Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, all right, I got your attention, that's good. I can hear you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I know, look, I've got a microphone here and I have a microphone for the, for the floor as well. So yeah, thank you very much all for attending. This is the 35th Edith Mary Gayton Memorial Lecture. And I'm very pleased to start this session without saying, can you see my screen or can you hear me? <laughs> so it's, it's actually a live event with people in, real people in the room, so that's very good. Um, however, and since when we were organizing and deciding about the structure of the event, the Omicron had just emerged, so there were still some um, indications of the COVID-19 not, not leaving us easy anyway. So we decided to have this as a hybrid event, so therefore I would like also to welcome the people that they have joined us online. Uh, so we've got quite a few around the UK and, uh, and Europe. So before uh, introducing the speaker for tonight, I would like to just um, explain how the event will is structured and how things will work, especially with the uh, Q&A session. So the speaker will have like a 35 minute uh, lecture session. The people that they have joined us online, they can use the Q&A function, which they can find on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, a message, a welcome message has been posted there to inform them that the Q&A uh, session is open. So during the lecture, uh, you don't have to interrupt the, the session, but you can post the, uh, the question there. So that was, should be uh, quite straight uh, forward. Now, at the end of the lecture, I will invite my colleague, uh, Richard Tranter, uh, to run the face-to-face the -face Q&A session. And I will then join Kristalla in order to manage the questions that they will be coming in uh, online. And I will read those loud for those of you within the room, so you know what the question is about, and also for our speaker to hear and answer uh, the question, because we cannot have those questions um, upload it on uh, the, the screen. So I hope that all this is clear. But if you have any questions, please uh, stop me now, those of you in the room, or those of you online, please uh, just use the Q&A um, uh, as a practice to address any questions at this stage. Okay, so uh, let's start with introducing, therefore, the event. So as I've mentioned, this is the 35th Edith Mary Gayton Memorial Lecture. So Edith Mary Gayton was a student uh, in the Department of Agriculture during the interwar uh, period. So her husband made a bequest in her memory and the farm management unit at the Reading University has the responsibility for those funds and uh, part of that funding is used for this memorial lecture, the annual memorial lecture, but it's also used in order to fund some of you in order to travel and attend the National uh, uh, Farm Management Conference, which is introduced and run by the Institute of Agriculture and Management. Uh, so uh, we are helping uh, undergraduate and also master students uh, to attend these national events. And in addition, um, it is funding visa students. So has currently, so since I've uh, been um, the director of the Farm Management Union, we had five uh, students uh, graduating as uh, PhD, as uh, doctors from this uh, university. But let us move us now to the lecture, and it is extremely appropriate that we welcome Nick Green, uh, who is the Farm Operations Director for Alvis Bros. And uh, Nick is responsible for the business, uh, businesses, three dairy farms, the beef, arable, big pig and contracting enterprises and looks after the non-farming estate as well. He is an Atfield scholar and alumnus of the Institute of Agriculture and Management Leadership Program and Windsor Leadership Trust. Oh, excuse me. We need to silent out mobiles as well. I forgot to do that. <laughs> 
Okay. Apologies for that and apologies for the interruption. So, as I've mentioned, Nick Green is a uh, Nuffield Scholar and alumnus of the Institute of Agriculture Management Leadership Program and Windsor Leadership Trust. Uh, outside of the business, he is a chair of the Council of Awards of Royal Agriculture Society's English Panel, a trustee of the Farmers Club Charitable Trust, trustee of Family Education, and long standing council member of the North Somerset. Agriculture Society. Uh, the topic for tonight is farm business management and the farmer as an entrepreneur. So I think it's quite topical and the, the unit, the farm management unit decided it is quite topical because farm managers nowadays, they need to develop lots of different skills and develop a set of competencies in order to be able to diversify the businesses, but also to uh, be exceptional within uh, <coughs> Nick Green, the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much, Your Honour. Um, so good evening, everybody. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here to... gives me great pleasure to be here to talk to you tonight, um, certainly on the the occasion of the 35th Edith Mary Gate Memorial Lecture. And I have been an attendee on numerous occasions in the past. Um, I'm honoured to be standing on this platform following in some of the footsteps of some pre predecessors. I've been asked to talk about farm business. Thank you. I've been talk, asked to talk about farm business management and the farm as an entrepreneur. Um, and if you actually look at it, it's a bit of a dry subject, or it can be a dry subject. So what I would like to do is try and put across a little bit of the theory as I understand it, but talk to you about my life and my farm and business that I'm involved with, and just see if some of that entrepreneurship and the, you know, the role of the entrepreneur comes out um, in that farm and business. And there's loads and loads of books to you get stuck into with this, and there's loads of sources you can talk about. So what I'm going to be talking about is a really very small part of what of the information that's actually available in the public domain. So what will we be talking about? So we'll talk about what an entrepreneur is, an entrepreneurship, what is important to those entrepreneurs in the entrepreneurial world, and an entrepreneurship at Life Cross Farm. So a little bit about what I have come across in the last 40 years or so working for that one business. So if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, an entrepreneur is a person who makes money by starting or running businesses and especially where this involves taking financial risks. So you could read that as easily as I can say it, but if you actually think about it, that's it in, you know, in a basic sense. It's about somebody having a germ of an idea, putting some money into it, really getting stuck into it, and hopefully making some money out of it. So it becomes a profitable um, operation. Now, if you're actually looking at it, if you dig into it a little bit, the types of entrepreneur, as far as I can see it, is the person who has the germ of an idea, so he's the creator, he or she is the one that dreams out that bright idea. There are ones that kickstarts it off and gets things running. And then there's the builder, so the people who take that germ of an idea and the original concept and actually start building on it. It might be the same person, but on the other hand, it might be somebody different. Um, and then the third person, or the third type of entrepreneur, is the operator. So something is already up and running, and they actually build on it and develop it. And so you actually look at it, and if you look at the, you know, the context of this afternoon, as has just been mentioned, we're talking about farming and food production and the you know, rural resources that we've got. So you actually look at the resources that you've got available to you. So you've got the normal farm operation, the thing that you're actually already doing. You look at the buildings that are available to you, so whether it's residential buildings or commercial buildings or farm buildings, they're all the resources that can be used. And then you look at the land. Just because you produce food on land for the last however many years, it doesn't necessarily mean to say that you carry on producing food from it now. So it's an opportunity to consider other things. And then there's the, you know, you actually actually look at the people that are involved, whether it's yourself, whether it's other people, so the actual human resource and whether they've got the capacity to do whatever might be needed to be done. So building on that, you have to have the right mindset. You need to be really, really driven, have that dream of an idea and actually make it work, you know, start, start it up and make it work. Um, these people, the entrepreneurs, they're not, uh, they need to be actively engaged. It's not a case of sitting on the city and thinking, oh, I'm going to be an entrepreneur tomorrow. 
what can we do? It's actually being that live it and breathe it, so it's a mindset as well. You need to understand the market that you're looking at, and you need to understand the objectives of what you're trying to achieve, whether it's short term, long term, medium term, whether it's an emotional objective, or whether it's just economic, or whether it's a combination of all those things. So there's loads to be thinking about when you're actually talking about entrepreneurial ship. So, just developing on that, if you actually, if you look on the internet and type in types of entrepreneurship, there's dozens of different things that you can actually look at or follow up. What I've tried to do is just put out a few things that I think are pertinent to what we're talking about today. So, raw or farm-based entrepreneurship. So, if you start at the top, you look at the scalable startup type um, entrepreneurship models. It's quite an easy one to actually look at with this, and you could use, um, as examples, you can use the likes of Twitter or Google or Facebook. It's something that somebody's had that germ of an idea that you can build, or you can build it, you can develop it, and then scale up. And you look at those three brands as an example, they're global brands now, but they literally started off as small scale with somebody just having a bright idea. So if you look at small business entrepreneurship, Again, it's something that somebody's dreamt up or they're, you know, there's actually a business idea that they're trying to, they've developed, but they've got no aspirations to do a Google or a Facebook or a, you know, a Twitter type global domination of that business. It's just something that they'd like to keep on quite a small scale. They'd like to be ahead of the curve. They'd like to keep uh, um, engaging with their customers all the time. They want to be emotionally engaged with it. They achieve emotionally, but also economically as well. And I'm just, you know, just as an example, it might be the local butcher shop. And as long as he or she is doing things to engage the customer and ahead of the curve and keeping their customers coming all the time, it might be they do that 40 years and they're completely happy with it. And if you talk about large business, the opposite end of the scale, um, you could use examples such as uh, Microsoft or Procter & Gamble, or sorry, Mars or Procter & Gamble or Unilever. They've actually, somebody's had the original ideal years and years ago, they've got a core product offering and the entrepreneurship then comes around that core offering. So it's about developing offshoots of what they're already doing or the process that they're actually engaging in developing their different types of business. So again, it's something quite different and a different scale to um, the previous one. And if you're talking about innovation, the other, you know, the other way I would describe that is maybe somebody who's a serial entrepreneur. It's about somebody who has that germ of an idea, they develop it, they get it up and running, whether they fund it themselves or whether they get funded from somewhere outside. They run that idea, if it's a business or a product, they prove that it's successful, they run it for a number of years and then put the business up for sale. They sell it, they move on to the next thing. So it's a serial entrepreneurship that actually it's an ongoing thing. And if you look at some of these people, it's actually not a case of a lifelong role in one particular job, as might be seven or 10 years, finish that job straight on to the next one and start something else. So it's that sort of creative mentality. And then if you look at social entrepreneurship, it's a mouthful, isn't it? Look at social entrepreneurship, um, it's somebody who actually recognises that there's a need for a social, um, a social interaction. And it might be, if you look at recently, the last couple of years with different things that have been going on, food banks would be, might be one idea. Um, it's anything like that to actually develop an idea that actually um, alleviates, alleviates social, cultural or environmental issues. And we'll come on to an example of that in a while. Excuse the slide here, which is just a list of, a list of questions, but it's just things that you need to, um, I think, we need to look at if you're talking about entrepreneurship. And it's the things that are important to these people who are actually developing their lives as entrepreneurs. You know, if you actually look at it, they take what they do seriously. These people who are developing businesses, the responsibility is there is to actually make a success of it. Whether it's just them that's running their business or whether they're employing people, it's up to them to make sure it's a successful business. It's down to them whether the rent's the rent paid or the other bills are paid. It's their decisions and ability to run that business that makes it a success or a failure. They make it all about the customer. Any entrepreneur 
is about delivering something to a customer. And if you don't understand what your customer wants, or what they actually need, you're never going to make the business a success. So they're thinking about the customer all the time, day in, day out. They make the big decisions carefully. You know, if we're actually talking about decision making processes in these businesses that are being set up and being run, they're actually really, really careful about the decisions that they make. It's not just rash decisions made at, you know, on a whim. They actually need to consider the financial impact, the economic impact, the social impact, the impact of the people that are around them. And they're not necessarily they don't make those decisions on their own. They actually take counsel and advice from other people. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's good to get other people's involvement and in, input into it as well. The next one is reason to be self-explanatory. They're not scared of the road less travelled. There's actually no point in doing a Me Too operation and just doing what somebody else has done before. OK, so it might be successful, but you'll never be the one that makes loads and loads of money out of doing it and, you know, internal, eternal, um, you know, it's internally successful. The people that are developing these entrepreneurial type businesses, they need to be trailblazers. If you can imagine Richard Branson back in the late 1960s and 1970s doing what he did, he was a trailblazer and he set the scene for loads of people following him. If you look at Elon Musk, he's somebody who's a trailblazer and he's going to be the one that probably makes a lot more money than most other people would do with what he's doing. A harness technology. There's a real need for to um, use technology to develop the businesses. And these people that are the entrepreneurs typically um, are the first adapters of most of the new technology. But more importantly, they might have it available to them. They need to understand either themselves or people that they're working with what that technology can do for them to actually uh, help sustain their business and grow it. So it's really, really key um, that they do that. They invest in themselves. And if you actually look at what people need to do um, to be successful entrepreneurs, they need experience. So that experience can either be gained first time themselves or they can use other people's experience and draw in that experience from other people. And they're never afraid to actually talk to people and actually draw out of people what they think of um, things that they're doing. Peer mentoring, fantastic opportunity for people that run different businesses to actually just talk to each other. It might be different industries, different sectors, but in similar situations, a fantastic opportunity to actually talk to each other and understand other people's problems. Now, those problems might be the same as yours and work out how to um, sort them out. Um, and dare I say it, it's always good to have a holiday to be charged. And I think never be afraid to have a holiday. And if you look at some of these successful entrepreneurs, they might be jetting off to the Caribbean. You think life's, life's hard, isn't it, when you're making all that money? But seriously, they go there for a reason. It is just to recharge and just to sit back and think, what could I have done better in the last job I did or the last thing that I've done? What can I be doing in the future? So it really is a case of investing in ourselves and actually understanding what makes them take and recharging those batteries. So on a similar theme, a similar theme, and I could have missed this top one out, they're constantly learning, but it's really, really important that they're learning from everybody and everything. It's not just a case of turning up to one place every day and thinking you're going to learn stuff from it. They're just, they, all embracing, they look at every opportunity of learning from other people and other places. Never afraid of risks when you're making decisions. Um, you can always have good outcomes and you can always have um, not so good outcomes, but risks are part and parcel of entrepreneurial activity. There's a real fine line between success and failure. Um, and again, it's those calculated risks that might make or break a business venture. And if you look at some of the things, and I'll hark back to Richard Branson again, but he's a fantastic example. Some of the things that he's taken calculated gambles on and invested in have been absolutely fantastic. Other things that he's uh, invested in haven't been quite as good. They're more difficult to find out about because he's not used as um, you know, good examples. But you know, it's a real life example of uh, making uh, calculate, taking calculated risks on um, deciding what to do. Okay, so there's always a time when there might be a failure and entrepreneurs are willing to experience failure. Failure, And I'll quote this rather than trying to remember it. Uh, failure is just information about what doesn't work. It's not the end of the journey. 
So in essence, bankruptcy, it's a case of understanding what's gone wrong, what decision was made that didn't go quite right, what actually happened to make it a failure, what can I learn from it, what can I use that information for for the future to keep going and do something better. And there is a willingness to experience that. We've talked about the customer already. Um, entrepreneurs adapt to the current needs of the customer in the market and they stay ahead of the curve. And it's whether it's a small scale entrepreneur or large scale, what they're endeavouring to do all the time is stay ahead of the curve and understand what the customer wants. So it really is a case of talking to customers and to a degree the suppliers so that you understand what the customer wants, what you need to be able to supply to that customer and actually how to make it work. And they know how to sell themselves. Um, and it's a case of that, again, is talking to the customers and understanding what the customers want. So we're talking about people trying to sell themselves, metaphorically, of course, it's about what they deliver as part of their service, about their goods or whatever else they're actually selling to the customer. They need to be, their integrity needs to be 100%. The credibility needs to be 100%. And if you can, you know, if you can sell that to the people that you're talking to, the customer, then it's, you know, you're halfway, down, halfway to actually doing it. And if you talk to different people, you know, some industry commentators, industry experts, some of the academics that have done some of this work um, on entrepreneurship, you'll see that customers are four times more likely to change suppliers um, if, they're, if they don't understand the person that they're working with. It's much more likely to change customer like that than it is about a price or a product type issue. So it's really, really important. And then they network, network and network. And it's just like this evening, there's opportunities for people in the room to talk to other people and actually understand what might be available to them, what they might be able to provide. Um, and it's the same wherever you go, it's always about a case of actually understanding how you might be able to talk to people and impart that information or what your view is on something. So that's the theoretical bit, and I'm not a lecturer, I'm not an academic, but that's my take on what entrepreneurship is about and entrepreneurs. And what I would like to do for the second part of this presentation is talk to you about a business that I've been involved with um, for almost 40 years that I think has got some really good examples of entrepreneurship um, in it. And so you can actually look at it, there's a creative entrepreneur, there's people that have built within the business, and there's operators as well. So hopefully there's some examples there that you can pick up. I'm not going to tell you as we go through it, we'll let you, um, we'll let you guess it and see what you can work out. So the business is Argus Brothers Limited. It's um, family owned. So do you want to do any of this, George? Sure. I guess you're just sitting there, so do you? Um, it's family owned. It's an integrated West Country farming and cheese making business. So what we mean by that is a cycle. It's a virtuous cycle. So cows are the mother of the business. Um, and when it was set up in 1951, um, two Olvis brothers, John Olvis and Sam Olvis, joined forces with their two dairy herds and decided they wanted to add um, extra value to their milk that they, produced, that they were producing and make cheese out of it. So the milk went into making cheese, the byproduct from cheese was whey, that was fed to pigs, the byproduct from pigs is manure, that was used as the first fertiliser and applied to the um, ground to grow the crops. Crops were grown fed to the cows and so that virtuous cycle goes round and round. And that was established 70 odd years ago and all, um, with the exception of embracing some technology to help, hopefully make us more efficient, um, that system and that cycle stays exactly the same today as it was then. So the business, and this is just going through what we'll be talking about, hopefully it'll give you an idea about entrepreneurship within the business. We're integrated, we've already looked at that on that virtuous cycle. We're market-led and not production-driven, so we need to understand our supply, our supply chain partnerships, customers, suppliers, and everything that goes with that. Devolve responsibility, which gives us the opportunity for that entrepreneurial streak. Um, and with any food business, it's about quality, quality, traceability, transparency. And we'll touch upon communication and education, which is a good example of social entrepreneurship in a minute. So we've got a mission statement. We don't have paragraphs and paragraphs about what we're doing in the business. It's dead simple. We're simple people, so we try to keep everything simple anyway. It's profit with integrity. We need to make a profit every year. 
you can make a profit one year um, by taking advantage of other people, but you won't make it the second year. So it needs to be with integrity. The integrity comes, or you can afford the integrity with profits, so they're inextricably linked, those two things. But it is dead simple, and that's the core, the core to the business. So the ownership structure, if you think back to 1951, there was two people involved in the business who actually owned it. Um, things move on and the next, gen the next two generations are involved in the actual ownership structure. So you can see it as easy as I can read it. Peter Alvis is the managing director. Johnny, his older brother, is company chairman. Um, John Alvis is Peter and John's father and Pauline Alvis, um, their mother, are both directors of company secretary and their uncle. Um, is Michael Alvis, who's the director. So you'll see a theme appear in there across it. It's a wholly owned business, wholly owned by the Alvis family. So you can see, see that as across there. So, and as things have grown and developed, um, it's gone from a small number of people employed in 1951 up to about 150 people as it stands now. The business has become more complex. And so we've got operational directors involved who are actually running the business. And again, Peter Alvis, is the managing director, he looks after the dairy operations as well, myself look after the farms and the estate, and then colleagues Ian Bug, Ben and Steve look after the commercial aspects of the cheese, sales and marketing and the finance as well. So you can see there's a structure appearing that actually allows us to run a business for other people, you know, for another family, actually we've got a reasonably, a reasonably high level of um, autonomy within it. Now, like I said, we're simple people, so we try to keep things as simple as we possibly can and the structure of the business is split down the middle into two. And the reason we split it like that, the dairy division is all about food. So it's governed by food legislation and everything you need to do to look after a food business. The farms division is very much about farming, but it's completely different from the food legislation. So it's really, really clearly defined. But within those definitions, it gives us the ability to manage those parts of the business um, and take advantage of what resources there are available to us. And dare I say, if there is an entrepreneurial opportunity, maybe take advantage of it. So if we look at the next level down, um, we will take the dairy, as a, the dairy division as the example. Each of those little boxes has a working departmental manager within it. So they're given profit and loss um, responsibility for their different department of the business. So the, the dairy produces cheese for the business, finished goods, they look after the cheese that have been stored in the cheese, um, cheese store and they package it, uh, cut it up and package it ready for sending out to the different customers. Sales and marketing, do all the sales and marketing obviously. And then we have the farm shop and local sales department that actually deal with all the smaller orders um, and people close to us. And then we've got quality assurance and the technical part of the business as well. So like I said, the people that are responsible for those different areas of the business they're all given the opportunity to actually express those entrepreneurial um, abilities that they might have um, and take advantage of it. I will say that is within constraints that we impose on them, but certainly they're given the freedom to make some serious decisions at different times. Likewise, the farms, a similar situation, and before anybody looks at it and looks at a second across from the left and thinks, oh, he's made a typo, um, Boxbush is a zero cow dairy at the moment. Unfortunately, it's one of three dairy farms that we had, but um, it's been struck with TB for years and years and years. We gave up the fight about four years ago. We've had to destock and crop the land rather than keep 350 cows there at the moment. But, um, you know, the intention is to put the cows back in there. Um, but again, each of those boxes has an individual farm manager looking after it, and they're given the opportunity to follow their part or manage their part of the business so they see fit, given the constraints that we put upon them. Um, and express these entrepreneurial spirit where appropriate. So if you look at the cheese dairy, and this is just to put it in context, we end up spending about half a million pounds a year just trying to keep ahead of the curve. So when we're talking about entrepreneurship, it's a case of developing the business and being one step ahead, whether it's different shape cuts of cheese, whether it's a different size, whether it's different packaging, or whether it's a different process or a new type of cheese. That's the sort of money that we're having to invest each year. For those of you who are involved in the food industry, um, BRC, which is the, the acronym for the British Retail Consortium, they audit on behalf of quite a few of the retailers in the UK. 
Um, and I think actually we're great. We could be graded as a grade A star because we're low spot checks. But that's the sort of things that we're, um, we get audited against. And you can see the logos down the right hand side of the screen. All of those things are schemes that we actually we are audited against. Again, it's not necessarily entrepreneurial type things, but it's things that we need to be in front of everybody else. And if we can be, if we can steal the march on our competitors by doing something different, then great. And that actually is in the sphere of entrepreneurship. And you can see what we produce: twenty percent of our production is organic, and it's registered to the Soil Association. And the remainder is non-organic cheese, and it's registered to the West Country Farmers PDA, which is the nice, pretty European type pattern down in the right hand side of the screen. So that's the sort of thing that we're doing on the cheese part of the business. But again, it gives everybody the opportunity, if we need to, to actually try and develop different things within the business to actually um, beat, the, beat the competition. Um, just so that you understand the sort of people that we're dealing with, you know, we've got some um, recognised retailers there. Um, we export to 40 odd countries. The Walmart actually is an interesting um, opportunity. We export to a couple of Walmart countries with Walmarts abroad. Um, National Trust is an interesting market to get into. Um, we're certainly with the, the consumers there, it's quite different. The customers is quite different from your, your average retail customer. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we're working with. Farms, um, and this is the things when I was talking about the resources available to us as farmers just now. Okay, so we farm 4,000 acres, half of that is owned and half of it is rented or different agreements. And we've got a thousand cows and a thousand young stock, but we don't necessarily need to do all of that. You know, we're actually, we look at arable cropping, there's 1,750 acres of that. Well, we can grow wheat, we can grow barley. Um, we might not make much money out of it. We can do other things with it. And so that's that entrepreneurial type thought process that we actually need to go through. If you look at the resources we have available to you, just on that one slide, We've got 4,000 acres of land, we've got property, we've got residential property, we've got buildings, commercial buildings, we've got people that are actually there already, and we've got a load of machinery. You know, so we don't just need to think about actually producing food and producing milk that we've always, always done. There might be other opportunities, and that's the sort of thing that we're actually looking on a day-to-day -day basis within the business. And it's something that the industry needs to be looking at as well. Pigs. Um, we've got a piggery that holds 6,000 pigs. We make it dead easy, like I said earlier on. Uh, we're simple people, so we try to keep things simple. We contract finished pigs from 35 kilos up to 120. So pigs come in, we feed them, we muck them out, and the pigs go out. So it's as, it's as easy as that. We finish in between 18,000 and 20,000 pigs a year. But again, and you'll certainly all, we'll come to it in a minute. You know, that's what we've done for the last 70 years, but who's to say that it might change in the not too distant future? There's various opportunities. Now, this is a really interesting one when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, I don't know, 18 or 19 years ago, we had a very small contracting department within the business. Um, it did all the work for in, in, you know, internally within the company. But the chap who was running it wanted a bigger slice of the action. And he came to us and said um, he would like to set up on his own. Um, but the got the better of him. And rather than investing all of his money on his own, we decided to do a 50 50 partnership, so a limited liability partnership on a contract, you know, agricultural contracting business. So it really is a case. This is textbook almost of entrepreneurship, it's about creating the business. It's about building a business and then it's about running a business or operating a business. So we did that initially with the obvious the contracting business and subsequent to that as things have developed. So there's been other parts of it that we've done exactly the same again. We've created, we've built and we've operated. And we're going for another process now of creating, operating and building. So it really is, it is a really good example of what we're doing. Um, farm shop. Again, it's given somebody the opportunity to be entrepreneurial in that particular department. It's another one of the boxes that I talked about with somebody being responsible for it. You know, it's a typical farm shop and local sales, but they're given the opportunity to actually make the very best of what they can doing it. And I will say it's reasonably successful um, and it actually gives somebody the, the ability to build on the success of what they've actually already done. I mentioned social 
entrepreneurial ship just now. This one is a, is a classic. Uh, we used to have the Cubs, the Scouts, and the Brownies and WI visit the farm, um, you know, through the late 1980s and 1990s, just for an evening out to enjoy, you know, an evening looking around the farm. And then um, in 2000, a headmistress came to us and said, could we actually develop a programme of education for primary school children on an inner city school that actually was failing about food, farming and the environment, of which we did. Um, 400 screaming children came out onto the farm in separate classes in that first term and it was really, really successful. And over the next couple of years, so the other local schools started joining in and we ended up with a couple of thousand children coming out to the farm. We saw that we were providing a really good service to, you know, to these people to learn about different things. And so rather than us going out alone doing that, we recruited a board of trustees to actually set something up and get it going. Um, that was reasonably, or very successful, I should say. Um, we created a company limited by guarantee uh, with charitable status, uh, with the trustees guiding us, develop, helping us develop it. Um, and immediately pre-COVID, we were seeing over 40,000 children a year in North Somerset, Somerset, Devon, Cornwall and Staffordshire. And hopefully that would carry on growing. So it's another classic example of social entrepreneurship. Time's marching on, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Got a Four or five minutes. Four or five minutes. That's spot on. Okay, so that's great. We've got the entrepreneurial spirit. People are allowed to get out and develop their different parts of the business and do what they think is right to actually make some more money or make it more acceptable, more uh, exciting. But those people, they actually need some support. So it's not just a case of letting them run riot and doing what they think. So corporately, we provide administration and secretarial support to these people. The people are actually out on the ground making decisions about what cows to serve with what AI ball and what recipe to use for the cheese and whatever else that they might be doing. So it's up to us as managers of the business to, uh, to support them. And one of the things that we do need to do, again, to make sure that business is success, uh, successful, is ensure the accountability of these individual people that were given pretty free reign to do some of the things they do. So we need to monitor our key performance indicators. We need to make sure, first of all, whether they're making money or not, or losing it on a month by month basis. And there's key, uh, sorry, there's physical performance indicators that we need to keep on top of as well and actually understand whether some of the decisions that are being made are right or some of them are not quite as right as they might be. And um, so it's really important to us as business managers to understand if there's a success or failure and whereabouts they are on that fine line uh, in our decision making process. And so what I'd like to do is just a couple of examples of actually what we've done within the business and whether you call this entrepreneurism or it's just you know developing a business I'm not really sure but it's an example so we put 175 kilowatts of solar PV up onto the top of the cheese store roof um, and by doing that we've got I'm assuming that we pay for the, uh, the installation but we've got free issue energy every time the sun comes out or the sun rises we get daylight it starts generating electricity we've got enough electricity in there or being produced to chill the whole of the cheap to chill all of the cheese stores. So that's great. So the electricity to chill all the cheese stores is coming from a natural source. The heat is generated from that refrigeration. We capture and we heat exchange with water. We produce about 50,000 litres of water at 55 degrees every day that we use the following day in the cheese dairy to actually start washing down and things like that. If you imagine water comes out of the ground at 15 degrees, and we're heating it free of charge up to 55 degrees, that's the enormous saving in oil that we're not having to spend. So economically it's beneficial, environmentally it's beneficial. So whether you call that entrepreneurial or whether it's good management practice, I'm not entirely sure, but it's an example. Now this is another real life example that we're considering at the moment. And if you actually go through the list of what I talked about, about entrepreneurs just now, it's about anaerobic digestion. And you can see what the potential output of that is. Um, with the electricity and heat. We can use all of the electricity and all of the heat in our cheese making process. So we can be off grid when it comes to actually um, sourcing power. So if you remember this, this slide that I did early on, as entrepreneurs and whether that's again, whether it's entrepreneurial or whether it's good management practice, we take what we do really, really seriously. 
So we're actually looking at this, we're deciding whether we, we keep pigs, whether we develop energy. So, you know, this could replace the pigs in that virtuous cycle, or whether we do both. So it's a really serious question that we're asking ourselves. You know, what's the customer? Well, the customer is ourselves when it comes to producing the electricity and heat. We can use all of it, so we don't have to worry about exporting it to the grid. You know, so, you know, the customer part of it is easy. It's a big decision. This is pretty significant, whether it's an emotional decision about getting rid of pigs that have been in the cycle for the last 70 years, or whether it's just about the finance of it. It is a big decision. There's technology, and so we would embrace the technology <coughs> if we were to introduce this into the business. Um, and again, it's about learning. So we've had meetings with a couple of people recently, or two people in the last two weeks. It's all about learning about this anaerobic digestion and the processes that go with it. And that's been going on for quite a long time, it's just not, that, not just the last couple of weeks, but we're taking advice and trying to understand it better. And the big thing with this is that fine line when it comes to the calculated risks. And is the risk too big to take? And will we be, you know, we're talking millions of pounds here, not just a couple of hundred thousand. You know, is it too big a risk and will we be doomed to failure? Or how would failure impact on the business? So that's where we're looking at with that. So in summary, this is the business and this is what we're actually looking at, whether it's entrepreneurial or whether, again, whether it's business management. There's a total recognition of adding value. We need to add as much value to whatever we produce as we possibly can. And it might be, if we're looking to add value to our farming system, it might not be producing food, it might be a pet cemetery or allotments or recreation or leisure or something ever different than just producing food. We need a continual effort to improve technical efficiency. And this is where the big business type entrepreneurship comes in. We've got a core offering or core product. It's about um, entrepreneurial type efforts to improve that. Understanding the supply chain. You remember I talked about customer, customer and customer. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to speak to our customers and dialogue with customers and suppliers. And at the end of the day, we need to be the best at what we do. That's what we really need to do. We need to be in front of everybody else when it comes to the competition. And if you think about the Greek philosopher Aristotle, um, he said, and this was a long time ago, so I don't remember it. <laughs> the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So it's quite a straightforward you know, um, statement. But it's really, it's quite illuminating really. Now, if you have a business full of people that work together, that utilize the resources available to them, that understand the market and share the same mindset and objectives, in effect, a collection of entrepreneurs, that should always be the case. You should always be better than everybody else. And at that point, I'd like to thank you very much for listening. I welcome any questions. Thank you. Take over the Q&A session within the room. So I've graduated into this role because years ago when I was a young boy, I, I was primed to ask the first question if no one else asked them. So uh, you know, it just shows if you stick at it, what can happen. Um, we have two rules about the questions. First of all, we want people to say who they are, where they're from. So Jane Smith, dairy farmer, Berkshire, or, or whatever. And the other one is we only want single questions, not these complicated double ones, because we think it's unfair to other people who might be wanting to ask questions. We've got half an hour allocated uh, at the most, uh, and I'll, because otherwise the refreshments out there will be getting cold or, or hot, as the case may be. So can we have one in the, in the room first, please? Someone. I'll just carry with one. I don't even take my mask. I don't, actually, I don't need that. I've got a very loud voice. Ask my students. Um, I'm interested in. Are you going to say it to the rest oh, of the panel? Well, please. I do apologise, Richard. Angela Crockley, I work in real estate and planning here and run the Masters in Rural Land and Business Management. Um, I'm very interested in the continuing role of the family members who are involved, still involved in the business. Um, can, you, can you tell us a little bit about how, how they're influencing your, um, your, your behaviour within the business? Okay, that's a really good question. 
So um, one of the so we've got we're into the third generation of executive management. So the third generation that are in the business, um, and the fourth one of the fourth generation is in the audience. Actually, so you might correct me on some of the things that I say because part of it is a bit as far. Um, so if you actually look at a, a brief history, that's in the case. So Mr. Alvis Senior, so John Alvis Senior, and Sam Alvis, who set the business up. I never met Sam Alvis, but certainly John Alvis, he was. Um, absolutely driven. So he knew at a very young age he wanted to set his own farming business up and he was going to grow it and grow it and grow it. I don't think, if you ever asked him, I don't think he ever said I want a thousand acres or a thousand cows or whatever else like that. I think, you know, when it came to his obituary, somebody said that he actually put one stone in place, cement that wood in and put another one on top of it and that was the way he built the business. But he had a really entrepreneurial spirit, you know, with them. The next generation, so John and Michael, they carried on with that spirit of actually developing the business. So instead of just make, starting it off, they actually grew it. And if you go through the 1960s and 70s and the early 80s, the business just grew and grew and grew. And it was growing sustainably all the time. Now I think the really difficult job comes now with the third generation of actually somebody created it, somebody's built it, the third generation needs to carry on and develop it. But I think that's, you know, that, that drive in the development is actually what's driving them as well. That's what their core aspiration is. Um, and I wouldn't wish to embarrass anybody, but one of the, well, Peter Alvis, he's the one who's got an engineering background rather than a farming background. And if you're actually looking at entrepreneurial spirit and developing different aspects of the business, he's the one who's actually picked up with the cheese packing, for example, cheese making, it's pretty well the same as that has been for hundreds of years. But packing cheese and taking it from a 20 kilo block down to a 20 gram stick, that's the bit that actually adds value to it. And that's the thing that you could actually, you don't employ somebody to stand there with a knife and count a 20 kilo or 20 gram bit and stick it in a bag and see it. That's the bit that sends pieces of cheese down the production line at 180 pieces a minute. And that's what's driving him. Johnny is the farmer of the, of the family. He just wants to farm. And he is looking to do everything as best he possibly can. He gave, you know, embrace the technology, but again, farming is farming, really. It's talks about producing food, you're doing it as efficiently as possible, and embrace the technology to actually do it. So that's the driver as far as those two are concerned. The next generation, I think, is going to be really difficult, um, more difficult than the, you know, the third generation, because I think there's going to be so many um, opportunities in them. We're in a world now that, so say, we can feed ourselves globally, so we won't necessarily need to produce food at the moment. Now, we can get into politics if you like, but that's not the, you know, that's, that shouldn't be the case tonight. I think we're going in the wrong direction by, you know, doing everything to do with the environment rather than producing food. But I think there's going to be so many opportunities available to the next generation of people running this, you know, this business. It's going to be, it's going, I think it's going to be really, really exciting. I think the difficulty comes in deciding where, if, where the resources go to actually fund it. Um, but to my mind, the next generation got fantastic opportunities. And it's not just going to be about food, it's going to be about so many other things as well. We've got one online now. Yeah. Do we know who they are? Uh, well, there's Gillian. Um, fantastic talk. Thank you. What advice would you give to students who are passionate about agriculture and dream of owning and buying their own business? Gillian Rose is our school director of teaching and learning. Okay. For those here who don't know. Thank you. Well, Gillian, that is that's a really good question. Um, now then, there might be a burning desire for somebody to own and run, you know, own their own business, and whether that's owned land or whether it's rented land, but um, you know, to run, their, to run on that basis. Um, and I, you know, I've not had that experience. And to be honest with you, other than a couple of years in my early twenties. I've never wanted that experience, you know, but that's me personally. Um, I don't think I'm very well placed to give that advice about what they can do to, you know, to get their own business. The one thing I would say, I was talking to somebody about this last night, actually, you don't really, really need to own your own business to actually be entrepreneurial, to enjoy a career in agriculture. You know, and I've just said myself as an example, I was number four in a team of four when I first joined the Alvis business and I've worked through the business I've been given a fantastic opportunity to develop myself within it, but at the same time, develop the business that goes with it. And within my network of people that I talk to, 
there's lots of other people in the same sort of situation that have been given fantastic opportunities to run reasonably sizable estates. So Gillian, I take your point. So I'm, so I'm talking to Gillian virtually. I take the point about, you know, people wishing to grow their own business. And there is opportunities, but it, you know, it comes down to niches to uh, you know, get into that niche first of all to generate enough funding to be able to do it. But I wouldn't preclude um, preclude it from um, having a career in employed employment as well. So, uh, someone in the room next, please. Yes, thank you. My name is Fredy Bilongo. I'm a Master of Science in Climate Change and Development. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my question is, you were talking about the use of lactose to generate electricity using CHP technology. So I would like to know, uh, regarding the current context of energy spike, do you think like your cooperation might be interested in the future to partner with the University of Reading to run a strategy to evaluate like the impact of generating electricity for lactose instead of producing productive cheese as a part of your diversification of business. Okay, I think I think I got the question, but correct me if I'm wrong. So the cycle would be that when you take lactose, lactose is a byproduct from cheese. So we make the cheese. The way that comes off of you know is the byproduct. We break that up into three component parts. One is a whey protein concentrate that we sell as um, to go into the human food industry. The other is lactose permeate, which at the moment we feed to pigs and we feed to cows. Um, and then there's the water element as well that we clean up and we sell, oh sorry, we use to wash the cheese dairy out. So the lactose permeate, which I get into what you're asking about, the alternative to using it for feeding pigs would be as, a, as an energy source to go into anaerobic digestion. Now, I'm not sure, I think there's a couple of other people in the, in the UK actually use lactose permeate to generate um, as a feedstock for anaerobic digestion. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at. So it would be integral and it would complement the cheese production process. So that virtuous cycle, instead of having a pig at the bottom of the picture, there'll be an anaerobic digestion plant instead of, or as well as. So it's, it would be part and parcel. And again, it would be one of those things that it's a development you know, it's the development of the theme of what has been in place for the last 70 odd years. But instead of using an animal to convert that lactose into something usable, it would be a, it would be a plant or piece of machinery. Does that answer the question? Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. We've got one more question, which is related actually to technology again. So it is anonymous who posted the question. How important is technology in your industry? And what is the main barrier to using it? That's a very good question. So, okay, first part was what's the main technology? The, how important is technology uh, in your industry? So, um, I think technology is becoming more and more important. Um, if you actually look at technology and the embrace of technology over, I don't know, you could say the last 50, 60, 70 years, you could start off on something really, really simple. And just look at fertilizer being produced from you know from um, oil-based fertilizers and sprays. And if you look at some of what our predecessors had to put up with doing everything by hand and using animal manures, you know, we've come on leaps and bounds in that, in that sort of technology, and that's basic technology. Yeah, if you actually look at the sort of the last five decades, we've had technology introduced to help milk cows. You know, and I can remember milking cows with a bucket plant that used to put the cups onto their cows. On individual cows, you milk that one, you pick the bucket up and you swing it between your legs because you tow the school to the next one. You know, so that was pretty basic. You know, we've got milk empires now that actually, you know, the robotic milk empires, the cows have got automatic identification. You get, they go and get fed automatically, they get milked automatically. They measure the, you know, the, the blood cell counts in the milk automatically, they measure the yields automatically, they can tell if they whether they're pulling, they can tell whether they're cutting correctly, and all those sort of technology that's used in the dairy sector is great because it helps you actually manage those animals. So it is, I think it is really, really key. And I see technology as being, you know, is becoming more and more important, and not just for livestock. It's about, and if you think about the environment, about um, trying to reduce sprays when you're spraying crops, you know, if somebody can identify a weed plant 
or no, not so really. If a machine can identify a weed plant by the shape of its leaves and just give a little of spray onto that weed. So instead of spraying a whole acre with spray, your spray your spray is like a half of a square inch. You just you know you could reduce your spray usage by about 99 percent you know, and to my mind, that sort of technology is absolutely fantastic. If we're talking about safeguarding the environment and reducing climate warming or global warming and climate change and, you know, economics and everything like that, and, and technology is really, really important. And I think it should be embraced. And we should, as an industry and as, as a country, we should be promoting the research and development as well. Great. Okay, another one in the room now, please. Thank you very much for the talk, Nick. Uh, my name is Bert Gideon Smith. I'm a rural land and business management student. Um, I was just wondering how is the business adapting to global challenges such as the Australian trade deal, Brexit, and, and labour shortages? How is it adapting? And what do you see going forward? Okay, another good question. Um, so, Brexit uh, is one of those things, or we can start on Brexit if you like. It's one of those things that it was decided. You know, we have to live with it. You can say oh, it was the wrong thing, or it was the right thing. You know, um, it's a, it, that was the deck of cards that was dealt, and you just got to work out how to do it. I think we have, our sales and marketing director has put an enormous amount of effort into actually developing the supply chain to make sure that our cheese can still be exported into, your, into European countries. Um, and just as an example, I think before Brexit happened, we went through a seven stage process, a seven step seven stage documentation process to export a, a consignment of cheese. I think I think it's 49 stages now. So that's the sort of difference. A lot of people have actually gone, it's never worth it, we're not going to bother. But actually it is worth it because there's other people that are not bothering and there's still a market there, you might as well go on and do it. And if you can do it efficiently, then great. It's taken a huge amount of resource and dare I say it, you know, you can talk about entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurialism and it looks as though, it, you know, it should be positive all the time. It's about suddenly going out and setting the world on fire away doing something new or different or developing a new product. He actually, he was given the freedom to do whatever needed to be done and he sort of ducked and dived and worked out what to do it. So, you know, on that basis, you can actually say as a, a sort of an entrepreneurial outlet towards it. Uh, with regards to the Australian trade deal, you know, it's politics and I'm not... I don't agree with what's been done. I think it's not the right thing to have been done. But again, this happened. We can make representation to our politicians and um, they don't necessarily listen. I'm certainly, um, our, our constituency MP is all about free trade. And I actually spoke to him about it. And, you know, well, what, you know, so that, you know, that was that. Um, and you know, if you've got a government that is, you know, is saying that, at least he was straight with me, he didn't tell me the answer I wanted to hear. Um, you know that's what you've what you're dealing with. What was the third part of your question? Well he's only ready to have one question. So oh, right. <laughs> 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 uh, have we got one? We, yes, we've got uh, one more here on, online. And I think like on the sake of time, I think we'll take one more online and then we'll take one more from the floor and then we need to conclude. Uh, so this is from Peter Hopwood from Princeton. Good evening, Nick. Too few farm businesses give sufficient thought to how they are structured to facilitate growth and succession, or a sale, in brackets. Developing a new business on the farm is an ideal opportunity to take good advice and get the structure right from the outset. Do you agree? I do. So good evening, Peter. And um, Peter, he's not said it, but I do know Peter quite well and we worked with him quite a lot in the past. And he's a classic example of being a fantastic entrepreneur. He's actually, as well as being a farmer, he's developed different products and different things and different services. And if you're talking about identifying a market, actually uh, working out what you're going to supply, actually talking to your customers and maintaining those customers, and actually having that dialogue, and actually building a business up and running it and being successful at it, is a really good case to actually look at. He's an exemplar. So I do agree with what he's saying. And you know, the structure part of it is really, really important to get structured right, not just for running the business, but maybe selling the business at the end of the day as well, so that you, you can actually, you've got it packaged 
ready to put on the shelf or ready to put into the market to actually sell that business rather than just getting to the end of it thinking, well, what do I should do now? So uh, I agree with the points he's made. Great. So, the golden question. Jeff would be. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. How important and how do they do it? This is entrepreneur, sorry, Jeff Adams, uh, retired consultant. Um, how do entrepreneurs, or how should entrepreneurs recruit their staff and get them to own the standards to which the entrepreneur wishes the business to operate? What a question to finish, and we've just gone past the time to ask that. <laughs> so, okay. so I just remembered the last part of your question as well about staff, so we can include that in the business. Now, in all seriousness, Jeff, that's a really good question because if you look at entrepreneurs, they set really, really high standards. They set, more often than not, they set those standards in their mind to start off with. And it's just about they are leading by example. Now, if you've got, and I've got a good friend, and when it comes to actually networking and talking to people about uh, developing businesses, I've got a good friend who I've known for 20 odd years, started off on quite a small scale. And he's developed his business into a significant multinational business. So he's gone from one acre to hundreds of acres in Portugal, China, Hungary, UK, or Scotland, India. Right? When it was just him and a few people and one acre, he could actually get those standards instilled into other people just by walking around saying, I really wish you to do it like this. This is how I would do it. I'd like you to do it like that as well, please. But when you've got multi-sites and thousands of people at different times of the year working for you, it's really, really difficult to instill that level um, into those. And that's when it comes to when it comes to the bit, the piece about um, you remember about creating a business, developing a business, and running a business. I think that's part and parcel of actually those three stages of entrepreneurialism is actually you need to understand that when it's just you on your own, it's dead easy, you can set your own standards. But there's a few others working with you, reasonably easy as well, because you don't necessarily need a structure because you're doing the managing by wandering around and actually talking to people and making sure it's done how you want. The difficulty after that is getting people, selecting the right people to train or for them to understand that the levels of what you want to achieve and for them to distill that and cascade it to the next level of operator or however you want to describe it, and dare I say it, expand that into different places as well. And the key to that, I think, and this is from experience, my experience and other people's experience of talking about the same thing, is actually getting people that you can trust to understand what you want from them and the other people that are line report to them as well. So a lot of it is down to what I said just now about integrity. So, you know, you need to lead by example. The credibility by this is how we want to do it, this is what we need to do, and getting other people to buy into it, getting involved and engaged with that sort of level. I'm not sure whether that's answered your question properly, um, but it's a, that's a, what, it's a case of that personal touch all the time, I think. Thanks. All right, so thank you. I'm going to break Yorgos's rule and be an indulgent and ask you a question myself. Uh, I always think that we always take students to successful farms, and I do wonder whether they could learn better from unsuccessful farms. Have you learned for your to make your business successful from other people's mistakes or failing or poor farms and poor businesses? Um, again, that's a really good question, and I will say a lot of the time we look at things. We ne I say we never want to be the first. It's easier if you're not the first. It's easier to go to somebody who's tried something and learn from either their mistakes or their successes. Um, I would always say that you could go anywhere, you could go to the worst place in the world and you'll always learn something. And even if the thing that you've learned is what not to do. So I think in answer to your question, we've been to, we've been lucky enough, or I've been lucky enough, to be able to go to loads of different businesses and loads of different places and loads of different farms and different businesses away from farming. And actually you always pick up something and whether it's what not to do or whether it's what to do and how to do it, then great. So whatever opportunity, sorry, I'm looking at the audience now, whatever opportunity you get to go and look at other businesses and other people's businesses and other things, it doesn't matter if it's the worst thing in the world, they'll always learn something. So if there's an opportunity and an invitation to go there, 
take it because that you'll always learn something. You never waste time by going looking at. <coughs> Thank you. So I, think I hand over to Yorgos now to yeah. round things up. So I hope you have enjoyed it. I hope you have learned something new tonight. I guess the, the, the most important thing that I will keep from this is uh, to consider failure next time that this happens with a different eye, with a different perspective. So failure is an opportunity for us to you reflect, learn from our mistakes and move into the future, adopt our business, adapt our businesses to the challenges um, and opportunities. And I think like uh, it is important to uh, for, for the future generations to consider entrepreneurship or uh, the uh, the opportunity, if you like, to adopt a new uh, business ideas and business models as the way forward in order to uh, fight the challenges. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you all for attending. First of all, I would like to thank me for agreeing agreeing to be here tonight uh, for delivering such an interesting talk and answering with um, answering all your questions uh, uh, with, an, with a really uh, well and educated and informed manner. Uh, I would like also to thank Richard Tranter for running the Q&A session. I would like to thank the uh, Fisala for running the, uh, the online event and I would like to uh, thank also the uh, online participants on this event. I hope that they have also found it informative uh, and they've learned a few things. Uh, I will post the link with a video and I will make it available as well so they would have the opportunity and all of you would have also the opportunity to uh, reflect upon this. Um, also, uh, I, would don't, I don't want to forget Teresa, Teresa Hicks, who uh, helped us to organize this, helped us to book the room, and also uh, took all uh, the bookings. So once more, Nick, thank you very much Pleasure. for tonight. Can I have some uh, wine? There's some wine and nibbles in the cafeteria, so please join us uh, for the rest of the evening. Let's go. Let's go.